the AIGA South Dakota AI and art panel. And uh, just anecdotally, we've heard a lot of people talking about how to process and how to think about the, the new trends and the new tools that are available and people being really excited on one hand, being you know thrilled about the possibilities and trying out these new tools. And other, on the other hand, people being nervous about job security, but also like the implications of you know, every conversation about this eventually turns to Skynet and the Terminator and self-aware AI and sort of the, the hand-wringing kind of scared side of things, both professionally, but also philosophically and what it means to be human, questions like that. So we thought we don't propose to have answers to all those questions, but I think it's valuable to have those conversations in public with thoughtful, creative voices. And I'm glad to say that we have three such uh, creative and thoughtful voices here on the call. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Tim Murray. I'm, uh, I'll start with Molly. Molly is um, helping us with logistics. She's associate design director at Lemonly and an illustrator and, a, and an artist on her own. Um, she's also been a board member for longer than I have. So she's going to be monitoring the Q&A. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A um, tab down there. And so any questions that come up during the panelists, uh, during this initial discussion, Stick them in that Q&A and Molly's going to be sifting those and sorting those and surfacing the ones that seem the most relevant to our conversation. So thank you, Molly, for doing that. And my name's Tim. I'm the president of AIGA South Dakota. I'm currently teaching graphic design courses at Augustana with Dr. Twa, just up the hall. And I've been working as a professional designer for about 15 years. And about 10 of those have been at the Matt Jensen Marketing um, Agency. And so in all three of those roles, I've been thinking about both AIGA thinking about professional um, development and tools and things like that. As an educator, I'm thinking about how my students are handling and navigating these questions. And as a professional designer, I'm thinking about my own you know, career and how things are gonna go with these new tools. And so it seemed like a great conversation to have wearing all those hats. So we've asked each of these three panelists to give us a brief sort of introduction about their perspective, their introduction to themselves and also their perspective on the work and these topics. So um, Walter, do you feel, are you all set with screen share and tech? Yeah, you know, we're just gonna, gonna improvise a little bit here. Um, good. For those of you who've never purchased a new computer, I've got a new laptop and uh, it's not letting me screen share due to security stuff. So I have a second device here that I'll try and show you guys a few things. So yeah, when you're ready, I'm, I, I think I'm ready. Okay, great. So we'll start with Walter and Walter is a versatile artist. So this is the, the text that he gave me. Walter is a versatile artist who employs, deftly employs a range of mediums to create his art with expertise in photography, Xerox, wheat paste, spray paint, video and cutting edge technologies like artificial intelligence and augmented reality. His work explores a diverse array of themes and subjects. I mentioned that he gave me that text because he also mentioned to me that he had it rewritten by ChatGPT, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> so without further preamble, we'll turn it over to Walter. So uh, thank you everybody for letting me speak. You're gonna get the version of me that's just, uh, just my name probably popping up on your screen. Um, so I wanted to first just talk about my history with digital art making. Um, in 1996, I purchased a Macintosh G3 tower and a 21 inch display and uh, was scanning work, um, scanning negatives, scanning slides and other mater source materials from all over the place. Um, outputting to negative because you couldn't get prints made that were decent quality at that point yet. And then, um, or outputting to slide and then um, doing these really political pieces uh, for what it's worth. At the time I was very angsty and, and so I was creating these anti-homophobia pieces about the church and all kinds of crazy stuff. And as soon as the first digital cameras came around, the first uh, Sony Mavic, Mavica, um, I was shooting half a megapixel camera or images and collaging those. And the whole time, everybody at the University of Minnesota Art Department was like, you can't do that, you can't do that. And so as soon as I started playing with, and, and of course, eventually everybody was doing Photoshop and Photoshop became a universal tool for photographers and art makers and designers. Um, and 
back in September, I started, I, I've been on kind of an art making binge for the last year before that. And I started playing with um, some of the AI tools just out of curiosity. And um, very soon with the reaction I was getting from people, um, especially artists um, being wholeheartedly against this idea and this idea of uh, uh, stealing images, um, I very soon knew that I was on the right path to doing things that I wanted to be doing. So I'm gonna start by just showing you the first image or, or one of the first series of images that I saw. And I apologize, I can't do both at the same time. So uh, can, you guys, can you guys see that image there? Yeah. So this was, this was made from a poem about the, a friend that committed suicide um, who introduced me to punk music via a single record. And the, the, it was a simple poem that we used in a song. Uh, so it was pick the record up, pull the record out, put the record down, drop down the needle. And when I saw this image and then, well, maybe it's gonna give it to me. Oh. Um, and images like it, I soon very quickly understood um, that this was not copying artwork. So this image that you're seeing now is one that I made today. Um, literally uh, just with, with the newest version of Mid Journey, I was like, I, I wanna see what that image, you know, two generations looks like that's different. And uh, really I started to notice that it was not what everybody was saying that it was, which was copying images. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amalgamating, it's learning paired with the text that I input. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of scroll through these. There's another one that I did early on. Um, and then I started inputting other thoughts and, and other poems about um, control and, and whatnot. This is early on and just started to really enjoy like how the textures were, were so unpredictable. Um, in the early versions of, of Mid, Mid Journey, I really enjoyed that. Um, and so I just kept going with those um, and eventually found myself um, here, hang on just a second, sorry. Um, I kept going and found myself just diving deeper and deeper into it. Um, and then eventually I got to a place where um, I started figuring out that I could input my own images and combine that with texts about um, design. So, um, you know, if you have design elements that you really enjoy in the work that you're doing, uh, it's nice to um, throw those ideas into into the work. And um, so these these images would have started with a seed image of my own. Um, in the case of this particular one that you've got up right now, um, this was from a photograph of my mother-in-law as a child um, that I input in, um, along with some text and some stylistic. Um, choices you know i think one of the big things with with ai and art generation is to really like focus on what you know about art making focus on what you know about techniques and, and technology and you know whether that's whether you're into oil painting or design you know really utilizing the language around the artwork that you've made in the past or that you're interested in and then starting to import that so like this piece is um, you know, I'm starting to get into like black and white iterations of, of uh, like chaos illustrations. And then I dove in a little further, sorry, go a little bit farther here and started taking images and combining them with other AI images. So this image of this kind of robot figure um, is combined with other textures. And that's when things really started getting interesting to me, this idea that we could take um, textures like this has has a, a printout from a steel piece of steel in a in a steel yard that I photograph um, and once you start adding those those textures to it it starts to become more and more interesting to me so what I ended up doing was seeding images with my own images giving a stylistic direction and then taking the outputs and using Photoshop to collage more work on top of it um, and that to me is like where 
I feel like AI starts to get more interesting is when you not only don't just rely on the AI, but you start to actually look at what um, the images you produce are and taking those and imparting something of your own into them. Um, so then I'm taking, I'm getting to this point where we're starting to collage stuff together and using street textures from other parts of the world that I've been to. Um, I think this one here, this is the one I wanted, I kind of broke this one apart for you guys. So this was the image that came out of Mid Journey. And then I took this image of a uh, graffiti wall in, that I photographed in Morocco um, and then started to overlay that to create more texture and bring out parts that I wanted. Um, so bringing out just different little sections with different little details. Um, and then as you get further along, um, you get to this point and this is kind of the final piece. Um, and then what I was doing with that would be then to take that, um, just gonna pull up an image here, a video image here, and these images I'm creating now, taking them and putting them into an augmented reality. Um, so you can kind of see that you get that depth there and you start to see the image and how it breaks apart. So it's not just an AI image, it becomes more than that. Um, and that to me is like where this stuff really lives is like when, when you get, sorry about that ghetto ass way of doing this, um, but, but where, where, you, where you start to take the human element and add it back into, into the work, um, that way you're not just letting a machine output something for you. Um, you're really allowing it to, um, you're allowing it to become a partner or a tool that you use as opposed to just relying on it to create a, you know, Picasso painting of Barack Obama or something, you know, like, yeah, you can do that stuff and it's fun and you can play around with it, but it's not, to me, that's not meaningful where it becomes meaningful is when you impart something of yourself in it, you know, both from the seed image and the text you put in, but then also after the fact, and a lot of times I would take the image that I produce after the fact and then put that in again. And that's where some really interesting and chaotic things start to happen where the images really start to feed each other. Um, and then you continue to just to, just to um, impart those stylistic concerns, um, output. And then now with the augmented reality, I'm, I'm looking for a way to, uh, um, for instance, like this, so I've got this piece that will be a, hanging on a wall. You have a QR code next to it and you turn around into the gallery space and it becomes the gallery space becomes filled with this three dimensional version of the image that hangs on the wall. So to me, it like it just becomes more and more layered. And I think that that's true as an artist. You know, that's what you're doing anyways, right? You're creating history and, and creating history in this new um, artificial intelligence world is really kind of an interesting and different animal than what we've what we've got to do in the past. So and and the fact that we can do it so quickly and iterate and really find that journey. Um, you know, maybe it's a little instant too instantaneous at times, you know, a little too euphoric that you can discover all of this interesting work very quickly. Um, and you know, the example I, I guess is that I've created 16,000 images since September. So uh, maybe I have a problem. So that's what I've got. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm I'm down for questions and whatever. So I'm gonna see turn this back over to you guys. Thank you, Walter. I think that's really um, one of the things that I've enjoyed seeing the work that you've been posting and seeing how you've approached it is like I see some of your punk background coming in where you're mixing and remixing, remixing the remixes, and I think that has created a lot of really interesting things. And you talked about sort of the human in the loop uh, idea where you're. You're setting the machines off on a course, and then they come back and you redirect them and redirect them again. So I think I think that's really interesting um, sort of perspective on that work. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the very end of the discussion here. So if you do have questions for Walter, put them in the Q&A down at the tab down at the bottom, and Molly's going to be curating those into a, a list of questions to talk about. But thanks, Walter, for sharing. Chris, you're up next. So, um, Tim, you don't have to read that whole long thing I wrote. <laughs> it's, it's, 
I'll, I'll read the, the bullet points then. Uh, Chris uh, has been practicing graphic design for the past 22 years, working with nonprofits in the cultural and higher education sectors in Canada and the United States. Completed an MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts in 2020, and has focused on continuing his research and studio practice in academia. He joined the faculty of the Art and Design Department in Binghamton in fall of 2022. And Chris's name came up to me uh, when I started talking with one of my advisors about interest in AI and AI exploration. They said, you should talk to Chris. And so we had a great conversation about some of his research. And I thought, I would like to hear more of this conversation mixed in with other voices. So, so thank you for joining us and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to talk about. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, it, yeah, that first conversation we had, I think we, we were like, let's talk for 15 minutes. And it was like an hour and a half later. Um, <laughs> Well, I got off, but yeah, it was uh, it was really great. I'm just going to share my screen. I've got uh, a little slide deck here. Yeah, uh, let's see here. Command L. All right, I'm full screen. Is everybody seeing basically a bunch of pictures of me in space? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, everybody, uh, Christopher Swift. So yeah, I'm a faculty, new faculty member at uh, Binghamton University in the art and design department. Um, just I think I'm on my second semester here. And I was uh, been a practicing graphic designer for about twenty years prior to uh, making the switch to academia, which uh, I'm really enjoying. Um, and I wanted to say thanks to Tim for you know organizing and inviting me to this. Um, so my work primarily, I'm, what I'm really interested in is kind of the the creative network in which graphic designers I think exist in, where we work with a lot of tools and people and ideas that really influence us and we are part of. And I think we don't uh, you know maybe pay enough attention to those. So a lot of my work is about trying to um, uh, bring um, uh, a presence or bring uh, acknowledgement uh, of those uh, tools and and networks into how we work. So this is a camera obscure I set up. Uh, in my bathroom in the town I used to live in uh, during the pandemic, uh, and it was, or during the heights of the pandemic, anyway. I'm not um, sure. sure it advanced. I'm still seeing the oh, astronauts. Uh, oh, no. Do you see uh, upside down trees in a bathroom now? Just the astronauts. No. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and reshare. That's bizarre. Okay, one second. Share screen. Bathrooms. Share. Bathroom? Camera obscuro. Yay. Okay. Well, um, hopefully I don't have to unshare and reshare over and over again. But um, so this is the idea. I, what I became really interested in this camera obscura is for where this idea that this exists without my input, right? This is just, there's a hole in a piece of cardboard in my bathroom. This light bends and refracts and makes this image regardless of my, my being there or not. This is outside of my perception even until I kind of sit in this room long enough to to kind of recognize it. So I kind of came really interested in this idea of like what my role as a designer was amongst this kind of network of tools and really wanting to pay attention to them. So does everybody see a different bathroom now or actually same bathroom, different picture? Fantastic. So just a couple of pictures of this. So I think this is what graphic design really is, is this like activation of kind of nodes on a large creative network of ideas, of technologies, of materials, of other people uh, that all kind of work together. And I think we often obscure this or don't talk about it very much because we're mostly interested in talking about how awesome we are and how creative we are uh, as individuals. And I think that's uh, often a, um, a mistake. Um, so this is, um, when I was trying to kind of explore new tool use, one of the things I started doing was trying to make my own tools. So this was created, uh, these are poster sets. Uh, created using p5.js and javascript uh, or jsx code which is um, the javascript that you use for indesign uh, and uh, for adobe products uh, and so these posters are generated basically i just kind of wrote some wrote some softwares hit go and generated these objects and i so i have very little kind of input into these other than kind of being a part of that presentation or of, of that initial uh, sketch of an idea and so these are, um, I've written in, um, they're using a, a, a surrealist collage technique called Cubomania, um, which basically just takes an image, cuts it up into a bunch of pieces, rearranges it again, uh, usually chaotically or, or randomly. So the one on the right, I, I'm assuming everybody's looking at the same thing I am actually, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, there's a one, a gray one that says it looks like a glass of milk. Great. Um, yes. That one is set, uh, does reproduce the image in random, uh, uh, random uh, arrangement. 
And the one on the left uses, I think, a sine wave or a cosine wave to organize uh, the image. Um, so you can see it's it's less, it's not necessarily completely random, uh, a little bit readable, not quite. Um, oh, and I don't have uh, notes on that one. Um, and so I was really happy with how these were working, but I still felt like I had a lot more control uh, over this process than I was kind of hoping for. I really wanted to try to give the tools I was using more agency and the way I was kind of getting to that agency, only way I could think about getting to that agency at that point was um, to bring in ideas of randomness, to bring in like math.random really into the into the code that was uh, I was writing for these. Um, and I was happy with where they were going, but again, they were a little more, uh, uh, I was still directing them a lot more than I intended. Um, so then I started using um, kind of machine learning and JSX uh, instead. So using, uh, right now I'm doing, um, uh, the, the software I'm using is uh, Stable Diffusion um, instead of Mid Journeys, uh, kind of uh, um, an online version. Kind of, uh, I've got a local install of a similar one called Stable Diffusion um, that I run off my laptop. Um, and so I've now been using uh, that space to create uh, these uh, kind of collaborative image posters where I'm giving the prompt, I'm giving the idea. Uh, and getting an image back and then working with that image. Very similar, actually, to I think what, what Walter was doing. Um, one of the things I find kind of really fascinating about this kind of work, though, is instead of kind of uh, programming and working in code is very declarative. Like, I write, uh, I write my code the exact thing I want, ideally, if my code is written well, happens, right? It is, it is a... I make the statement and it occurs. And the thing I find really kind of interesting about this text to image uh, creative space is it is it is a lot less declarative. It is much more like a creative work that I have to share with somebody. So I I, I say this is the thing I would like to see, and then my audio or my my collaborator, this this kind of seemingly very alien kind of presence here, like reads my words and gives me an image back. So these are pictures of I think that. Oh, I don't have the um, the prompt here, but these are um, posters uh, of um, the movie Eyes Wide Shut. I think in the style of, I want to say Alexander Rodchenko would maybe have been my prompt for this. But it gives me back something that is much more interpreted. It is much more of a collaborative kind of response as opposed to the very declarative uh, code of those previous versions. And the other thing is, I also don't really know how these work, right? This is I, I can kind of kind of nudge them directions, but I don't I don't understand the processes behind these. I don't have a uh, you know the computer science degree necessary, I think, to to fully understand this process. But I think it is a tool that I work with, uh, that I collaborate with, and I don't understand. I understand how this works basically as well as I think how I understand the pen tool works. Like I understand the interface of the pen tool. I understand that I click and I drag a line and it starts a Bezier curve, but I don't actually know the code behind what that does or how that's, what that actually is doing beyond the interface. And I don't think this is radically different. I think this is just a more extreme version of how those tools work and are kind of disconnect from the, the black boxes of the tools we use anyway. Uh, so this is part of some a new project I'm working on uh, about um, climate crisis, imagining uh, flooded spaces um, uh, around America. These are um, flooded spaces in um, Newport Beach. Uh, I was on vacation there recently, and I right by the water. And I thought this a lot of this won't be here next time I visit, maybe you know, or, or in not too far off in the future. And then this is from the another part of that project for uh, parts of New York or in Manhattan, uh, devastated by climate crisis. Um, but one of the things I found kind of compelling about this is the only reason it knows how to make these images is because the climate crisis isn't in the future. The climate crisis is, is now and these images are trained. This I can make these images because other parts of the world uh, are already you know, um, severely affected in, in these manners. Um, and then this is going towards uh, making a, uh, a pr part of my um, speculative anthropology project. Um, this is a, uh, a future zine, uh, a zine that from the future that you will that is found uh, now. I'm not really sure. It's so some type of time traveling uh, zine uh, about uh, the devastation of uh, the climate crisis with this uh, kind of Candide quote about uh, every uh, everything is for the best and that this is the you know the best of all possible worlds and just kind of thinking about um, trying to rethink our um, 
uh, our relationship with uh, climate uh, in in using these and using these tools. And then uh, I'll show you the, this last project I'm working on now um, is um, again being very excited about the machine learning aspects as one of the collaborators, but also interested in looking at the other uh, tools um, and parts of my of my you know creative network. So in this case, I'm kind of trying starting to explore uh, printing in a new I, uh, in a, a new manner. So I'm using uh, cyanotype uh, large format cyanotypes using um, uh, high power projectors to um, start doing uh, two and three D um, printing on these large format uh, very non traditional uh, outputs for for graphic design anyway. Um, and it's part of a, a new series uh, again, just that exploration of uh, who my collaborators are in the, in that tool in that kind of physical space. So thinking about my uh, the ideas of my inks, or in this case, not ink actually, um, iron ox uh, irons uh, that turn blue, um, and uh, and paper. And so I think yeah, that's the end. Uh, that was all of my uh, my talking. That's great. That's great. I have. I have a handful of questions, but I think maybe I'll I'll save them up for the the end portion. So we talked with Walter a lot about practice. We talked with Chris a little bit about practice and theory, and I'd love to hear from Dr. Twa some some sort of a historical context of how people have approached how designers and creative communities have approached new technologies. And so I'll, I'm just turn it over to you. Great, thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here, part of this conversation. So I guess I get to play the primogeny art historian and give the the yeah. long game or the long long picture of it. Um, and you know, certainly there's like the spectrum where you could say like we're all fine, you're all fine, it's all fine. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you mentioned like Terminator, or speculative fiction. And actually, what popped in, popped into my mind was like one of the one of my favorite quotes from Jurassic Park is like, you worked, you spent so much time and energy to figure out whether or not you could, you never stopped to figure out whether or not you should um, type of, of question. And I think that there's a lot more complex middle ground. So maybe the um, better middle ground or, or one place I'd like to frame the discussion is to think about in terms of the nature of the question asked dictates the nature of the quest of the answer you receive as an a more beautiful question gives you a more beautiful answer. And that certainly applies to AI in the sense of the data sets that they're using, these massive data sets that are input, whether it's images or text versus the output. But I think that it also has like a wider conversation and a wider audience as well, not just in the sense of these um, data sets. So, and maybe one of the things for the audience here or for all of us is to think about is like when we look at the literature and we and we put ourselves into the insert ourselves into this bigger and very important conversation of art and AI um, is like reading broadly. So if you read how the art news and the creative industries are talking about AI, it's very different than from the um, computer software and the data engineer questions and, and conversations. And some of the parameters that they're entering on that side, um, where might there be um, synthesis or where might it illuminate sort of different things. Um, and in framing this bigger conversation, I kind of broke it, my data set into like four categories. Um, the fourth being the sort of reference is this notion of audience. So a lot of the popular um, press on art and AI has often been about the audience receiving the image. And then it's almost like it's this gotcha thing. Like you go to exhibition X and you enjoy the artwork in the exhibition and then you have this big reveal at the end and haha, gotcha, it was all generated by AI. That was, you know, there's a lot of news about like artwork uh, at various state fairs, getting awards, being AI generated. Um, this conversation is also new and old in the sense that like the reception and the audience is also the art market. So back in 2018, Christie has already had a big $400,000 sale of a, of a quote unquote painting that was AI generated. And so how we receive the questions to the answers, audience you know, plays a big part of it. Um, and another big question that I think is then more in the realm, um, part of the realm of the creative industry is this big, big philosophical question of definitions of art, what is art? And the input of the computer software engineers is very different than um, we receiving it. And that's the background of it. I would say like as an art historian, and if you look at the long game, um, every culture wants to have this definitive um, notion of what are the parameters of art. 
but we know that that shifts quite drastically by time and that shifts quite drastically by culture. And so for those of those that are doing the gloom, doom and gloom that art is now dead in the face of AI generation, then maybe the answer is, then that means that our definition of, of art wasn't strong enough to begin with. Or if your notion of art and definition of art dies with AI, then that wasn't something that was strong enough to withstand time anyway. So that's part of like a bigger philo philosophical question. The third category I'd say is this notion of artist and, and maker, right? Um, and that came up, um, you know, quite a bit in both how Walter described his work and how Christopher described his work, that notion of you as the idea, idea generator um, first and AI as being your tool versus um, at what point do you become co-collaborators? Are you a maker and the AI engine your co-collaborator in it? And then the endpoint of as AI is, is um, developing so infinitely fast, you know, that speculative fiction is pointing to that endpoint where is there, are we coming a time where AI is indeed the, the maker um, and that there's no co human co-collaborator or things like that. And I think it's that endpoint that also makes people um, particularly nervous. And then I would say the fourth sort of data set or category that um, wraps around this is our notions and definitions of creativity, right? Um, if, if creativity, and this is where there's a really interesting difference in the conversation that's happening in the arts community versus the conversation that's happening with the data scientists and the engineers, is that when, and AI is not new, right? We're talking about like from the moment that computers and computing power is being generated, and like even into like the 1960s, that notion of um, that AI is out there and we're working on it had always been in conversation with creativity because data scientists had suggest we know that AI and the computing power has arrived if we get something that looks like creativity. And so while we're talking about this in 2023, this is a very um, you know, multi, you know, mid 20th century forward conversation. And then I'd say as an art historian, we have to even take it back further than that. So for if it's the notion of maker, how much um, do we need to have Christopher and Walter intervene in the image to still believe that it's human generated? Like they are of course standing on the shoulders of, if I've got, I've got a, at least one student in the audience here about in 1917 and Duchamp taking a urinal and turning it 90 degrees to test like how much of the intervention of the artists, you know, do we need to have? And he was standing on the shoulders of that conversation of, for the painters that are on this audience, I'm sorry, your field was already dead. It died in the 1840s when photography was invented, right? Sorry, you're already dinosaurs. But that might go, may take us back to the Jurassic Park comment that I began with. But, or it's that if your definition, when in the face of photography, painting needed to understand what it could do that that photographic tool couldn't do. So rather than replicating life as smoothly and as illusionistically as possible, right, we get that birth of wild colors and expressive colors and needing to show the gesture on the paint, like painting evolved to show what we couldn't do before that. And then just to make that an even longer story, it's not modern tools or technologies. If we go all the way back to even say the high Renaissance, we walk into the National Gallery to look at the Raphael painting of the Madonna and we appreciate it as this masterpiece done by this master artist Raphael and the label says Raphael and Madonna Cowper but it doesn't say Raphael and Joe Walter Christopher X and it doesn't say Raphael and workshop even though we know that Raphael had an entire team of assistants working on the paintings and he knew that it was his idea that formed the composition but then he let the machine run. One assistant would fill in the drapery, one would fill in the background. And yet we still, and we all know this, or many of us know this, and I'm sorry if I, if you didn't know this, now you do and I've just ruined Raphael for you. But you know, art historians knew this for a very long time. And yet we tell, still tell ourselves the narrative and the story that we want it to be purely Raphael and not all these anonymous assistants that we choose not to. So maybe I'll end my framing um, question with with even um, to go back to um, Michelangelo to sum that up, you know, that idea or machine in the garden type thing. Michelangelo in the 1500s um, had said and written, you paint with the mind and not with the hand. And he whose mind is not clear covers himself in shame. So we're still pop, we're, while this is very new, 
we've just stepped into a conversation that's at least 600 years old. But how we receive that conversation and how we adjust, I think, is a part of that, of that bigger story. So that's probably enough of framing questions for you. Like we could take the conversation, I think, in, and I'm looking forward to seeing what directions we take the conversation. And of course, we're going to solve this all in, in one hour, I'm sure. Yes, we got 20 minutes left, so <laughs> we're going to knock it out. Um, my apologies, I got so caught up in the conversation that I forgot to introduce you, but thank you, Molly, for <laughs> introducing Dr. Twa in the chat. <laughs> Dr. Twa is a print printmaker, curator, and art historian at Augustana College University. Um, but I really appreciate that perspective, especially the idea of this uh, bringing into the conversation, like the idea of the intervention of the artist and how much the artist needs to intervene for it to be um, their own. And part of the, for my own story, part of uh, what got me thinking about exploring more questions about it was that when my first, my first experiments with mid journey and playing with image creation, I got these images out from text prompts and I was really intrigued by them and they were really compelling. And I felt this sense of ownership over the image, but I couldn't put my finger on what I had done, like what, how much I had intervened to make that image happen. I felt like it was mine. I felt like it was, I had some connection to it as if I had created it, but I had more, I felt like ambivalent about it. I'd more watched it be created halfway and half like created it. And it made me think of like a Jackson Pollock where you sort of setting a, you're setting something in motion, you're setting a system in motion and watching it work. And it wouldn't have existed unless you were there. But um, so as we, my first question maybe to the panel is like, how do we think about that question of ownership, not in the sense of like a legal framework, but Dr. Twa's question about like how much intervention, like I see a lot of the, the threads in Christopher's presentation is about like surrendering control or sort of welcoming the serendipity of what comes out of these processes that you've set in motion. So open-ended question to all of you, but like how do how do we think about that degree of ownership? How does ownership line up with the intervention of the artist? And I don't again, I don't mean ownership in a legal sense, but more like a so, so something I think about a lot with um AI art and and it kind of goes a little bit to the ownership side of things is that as art, the art world has created a, uh, it's always been the case, right? Like we've, we've always had this elite, you know, bourgeoisie of art making, right? And you have to be to a certain point to be considered an artist. And what does that mean? And what is accessibility with artwork? And to me, like one of the most transformational parts about technology is that we really change the ball game entirely. Like anybody that has a phone can have access to these tools right so now you don't have to have the financial means to go to school to become an artist in order to create in order for your ideas to become something right and to me like the democratization of art making in any way possible is what is the best thing that can happen to artwork because it, creating artwork I don't know about anybody else on here, but rarely is it about what I'm going to present to somebody else. It's entirely about the process and making things that make me feel good, that get me out of my, you know, mental health state or whatever it is that I'm dealing with. And for me, like that part of art making, if we can give access to as many people as possible, I don't care what you put on a wall in a gallery. I mean, it's important in a different realm, but like the idea that any one of the, you know, 30 some people on this on this call can start creating artwork in a style, you know, today is, is transformational to the way that we think about creativity. And to me, like fundamentally, that's the biggest reason why I want to push this as much as I can, because the opportunities, you know, and, and not to dismiss people that go through an educational process, but there are so many people who don't have access, who don't have the support, the resources to get there. So for me, that's the biggest part of this is like accessibility then begets everything else that everything else that um, Lindsay talked about, you know. Yeah, Tim, you oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I would say I, I would, you know, I completely agree with um, Walter about that, that 
art making in the 21st century now is infinitely more accessible and that's important, right? That we get wider and more audiences. But I also wanna add to um, how Tim framed the, the original question about like the artists getting started and generating that it's, it's also a looping system. So it's not that, so I haven't been on your Instagram feed, Walter, but you said you've made 16,000 images in like a matter of weeks. I'm gonna guess you didn't put 16,000 images out on your gram, maybe you did, um, but that you as the as the maker, like I think the final step is that you also go back and decide which ones come to life, right? That there is, that's, that's also a human and also artistic intervention that you come, that while you're the machine, the tool, the making generates the images, you're gonna be the one who assesses the quality of it. And I think that's also what's lost in some of these doom and gloom uh, conversations about AI is that AI is now making art um, and therefore we're all done. Well, like AI, like humans make a lot of mediocre art and it's not that it's art or it's not art, but I think the finer print is how do you tell whether it's good art or bad art or, you know, and, and when I mean, when I say good art, that type of thing, like that it has sustaining power, that it speaks to its time period or it spe speaks to its maker and that it's received by an audience and it speaks to it, its audience in some sort of way. It doesn't have to be about beauty. It could be about beauty, could be about provocation, right? That there's a lot more of skill in that closed loop in the same sense where like Tim used the example of Pollock making a drip and splatter painting. But if you go back to like the Hans Nameless footage of Jackson Pollock making a painting and his voiceover, he actually also said, sometimes I lose a painting. And so he's cueing that while the making seems automatic and autonomous, there's a moment where he as the artist decides whether or not that painting stands or whether or not it goes back in the dust heap type of thing. And that's, I think also still, where like a graphic designer, a web designer, a digital artist, like you don't lose control because in the end, it's also about um, which images you choose to release out into the world that are gonna matter most to you and what might matter most to the audience receiving that image. Yeah, taste and curation, right? Like the, those those become the new skill, a big part of the new skill set. Yeah, one of the things I'm, I really, really like about these processes as well is I, you're I, probably everybody here has seen Helvetica. There's a scene in Helvetica where um, Hoffler and Fred Jones are talking and they start talking about how they have this like shorthand. They can speak to each other about, you know, like the Olivetti ad uh, from the 1960 has a certain feel that they want to get. And they're, and when, you know, everybody's like, oh, yeah, those Olivetti ads and like all the graphic designers all nod their heads like, oh, yeah, those are amazing. But there's this like this. Um, very narrow taste, right? That is is uh, referenced in that we like. There's a, a gatekeeping of knowledge and style about what is good and what is, uh, you know, pedestrian or or not good enough. That I think um, one of the things I'm really happy with these technologies as well is it kind of lower gets around that gate. Like you don't have to, somebody doesn't have to explain to me their project and then I can come up with some clever visual solution for it. They they don't need my um, filter. They can just kind of start, in theory, making their, you know, get around me and ex express what they want to express. I also came across this quote, this tweet earlier today. I don't know if uh, I'm just going to move out of the way here. Is it backwards or can it? Oh, that's right. I, which I, I quite liked. Yeah. Um, that, that distracted me from what I was going to ask. Yeah. One of the questions that came up or comes up often, like we talked about the democrat democratization of the process and creating anyone can create with these tools. And the idea that you don't need someone doesn't need to come to a professional designer to get their ideas across. So one of the questions that always comes up is, is mid-journey as a professional graphic designer, is mid-journey gonna eat my lunch? Or is it just gonna like chew up my lunch and put it on a, put it on a tray for me? So I think the same, you know, it's like the fiver. You know, there's all there's there's so many tools tools that are like trying to kind of get to to to, to bite into that sandwich as it were um and they're they're they were never a client that you were going to get right it, it's it's the person who had three hundred dollars to do an entire suite of materials and you were never going to work with them likely i don't i don't think we're, we're losing i don't think we're going to lose too much uh to, in that space 
I think that Cameron had the question of, do you see AI becoming a tool that designers need to know? Uh, I think that inevitably, you know, if you, if you're not embracing it, like it, it will, if you embrace it, it will inform your work going forward and it will take a big burden off if in particular, like I've used chat GPT for brainstorming ideas about blog posts and that sort of thing, like in mid journey for, for brainstorming ideas for designs. Um, you know, if nothing else, like using it as just a, just a reference, especially in those times when you, you know, somebody comes to you with this out there idea and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to put this together. And like being able to brainstorm a bunch of ideas that get you roughly in the ballpark. And then you can take those ideas to inform what it is you're going to create. Um, I think that it would be a mistake to ignore it entirely. I do have a one, one of my best friends is a, is a designer who is, who is very well known. Um, and uh, he has chosen to completely like put his head in the sand about it because he just doesn't want it to, to come to life. And I, and I totally get that, you know, he and I have those conversations, but, you know, I think that at least, you know, playing around with it so you understand it and understand its capabilities and then deciding how you're going to utilize it for the work that you're doing as an artist or a designer, you know, can be really, can be really powerful. You're not using these tools like a ton already. Like even if you're not using Midjourney, you're not using Stable Diffusion, you're not using these text image generators, like, fine. But if you're using content aware fill in Photoshop, like if you're, there's like the, the algorithms that we already give up a uh, partnership to, or already use like InDesign automatically sets your lighting at 120% of type height. Like, you know, ideally you're going and changing that, but a lot of people aren't going and changing that. Like the optical uh, kerning pairs in InDesign, like those, these things, we use them all the time anyway. This is just like, these ones are just so much more, you know, exponentially different maybe, but it's, we're already, I, I think the vast majority of us are already using these tools in some method. And I think this idea of like, maybe like differentiating like this idea of artificial intelligence versus maybe like machine learning. Like these are actually just incredibly powerful algorithms. There isn't, I think the like, the um, HAL isn't in the room the way we kind of think of it. You know, it, it, these are just really, really next level algorithms compared to the ones we've been using, but we are already using them. And I was thinking in terms of like on the education side, right? I mean, teachers have been um, recently, you know, quite freaking out about is, you know, not just on the image side, but the um, chat GPT side. So is the answer that like, or going forward with education that every student is sat in the room and you give them a piece of paper and a pen and then they have to write everything out? Or is it, do you start changing the parameters of the question? They can dictate they can generate the text quicker so that they have more time for, in the sense, the human assessment side, as in how does this text matter? Why does this answer feel better? Or does that help us to spend more time talking about the bigger meaning of a essay or a text? Versus, you know, So on the educator side, it is, if I'm asking a question that a student can just pop out through GPT, then I'm not asking a question of value or one that, find, that that student finds value in to respond to. And that's a very different um, type of, of mindset for sure. Yeah, I think also for graphic design training, there's a, a real um, need to maybe recognize that like being able to do kerning pairs really well is maybe a tool that is best left to machines and maybe kind of thinking about art direct, being training art directors is what we need to be doing more than uh, you know, uh, the production side. And as well, when we consider about you know how most art history or most graphic design history is often taught, I think as a kind of a style guide, where it's we look at the aesthetic only of uh, you know of Art Nouveau or something, and um, students recreate some aspect of that in their work, um, with, you know, empty of context or or meaning, um, and you know our ChatGPT or um, uh, Mid Journey or something along those lines does a better job uh, of kind of just mimicking art history uh, style. So I think, you know, we also need to rethink like, how are we teaching our graphic design history classes? Like, how, yeah, we need to rethink our, our, our classrooms quite a bit. I think in that sense of like danger is also opportunity, like on the educator side, like there's always far more that you want to cover or thought you could cover than you could possibly can in the classroom. And these tools might be a way for us to cover some things quicker to 
protect more time for like those bigger ideas that matter. And then for on the educator or whether or not a designer needs to know this side, I also like recently read that for teaching the fundamentals of what is good design, good art, is that there actually is a lot to teach us or tell us if you go into the software engineering side, like how they program the parameters for the AI to output something that's not just a complete random product, but actually a good product is actually the same parameters that you want to start in teaching our, you know, your foundations courses. And so we might need to move away from some of the common language that we, you know, find in your design one, design two foundation courses. And we can actually look to the computer software parameters to kind of help expedite sort of like how to, or like it's explained in a, in a, in a way that is fairly simplified and that might have some benefits for how we go about teaching some of these um, fundamental or foundational things. I'm going to grab one question. Actually, I want to bundle a couple of questions from the Q&A. Um, one of their questions, some of the questions are about AI as a collaborator or a tool. And another question has to do with when AI becomes a crutch or when it's like, when it's, so my question is larger about what is a, what is a healthy and productive and valuable use of AI versus what is derivative and lazy or not adding value. So like, what's a, what's a good way, how do you imagine a good way for artists, designers, creator in general to use these tools? I think that for me, it's about how much you're engaging with the tool, you know, how much of your idea, um, your concept or your direction is being put into, into it. Um, and also like how you're using the outputs. That's a big part of it as well. But I, I also think that like, you know, that the question about a crutch versus a tool, like, you know, that same argument was being made about Photoshop when in 1996, right? Like you're, you can't edit the, if you can't light a studio setting, like you shouldn't be able to make an image that looks good. You know, if you don't have that particular skill set, you can't do that. And the reality is, is like, as we know now with raw file, I mean, for those of you who don't know, but uh, if we're shooting in raw, you can almost make an image do anything you want because there's so much more latitude with a digital camera than there ever was with film. So to me, it's like, you know, it, it may start out as a crutch for people, but eventually it becomes an integrated part of how they operate. And, and at that point, it becomes a tool, you know, and I, and I don't know if that's a, a clean defined line or if it's really very blurry and, and it's really a transition as you educate yourself and you become more familiar with your tools and your creative process, then it becomes an integrated tool in your process as opposed to a crutch. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, that's the way I think about it. Um, one, uh, we're just about at the end of our time and I'd like to sneak in one sort of practical level question from Ivy. She's asking if you were, if someone wants to start experimenting with some of these tools, is there a good uh, recommendation as far as which of these tools that are available would you have someone start with? She mentioned Midjourney versus Stable Diffusion versus Dolly versus others. I think Midjourney looks has too much of a, an aesthetic that they've programmed into it. I think they've trained their model in such a way that it looks very often like a very often like a, a most people look like a, a jaundiced European skinny model for some reason. I don't really know what the reasoning is, but often I find uh, that aesthetic is present in a lot of mid journey. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, I use a local install of stable diffusion. So I have um, just kind of a, a relatively powerful MacBook pro um, and I can do a, uh, I have it running locally. So I'm not, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's. I think Midjourney probably makes a, a more, um, especially with version five that just came out uh, that I think Walter is using now. Um, it is f a phenomenal detail, um, and uh, Stable Diffusion isn't there. Uh, Midjourney is definitely, I think, the highest quality uh, for a like a photorealistic space. But I'm not, and uh, Walter looks like you aren't necessarily making stuff in that space anyway either. So, yeah, you know, I think that. So I've done a lot of very photorealistic stuff. Um, as well, and Midjourney is definitely doing really well at that. But sometimes I'll actually prefer to go back to the older versions because I like the chaotic outputs a little bit more. Um, I, I don't know the texture and the history and 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 that kind of stuff is is just more. Uh, it feels more organic. Um, the the new stuff in in version five is is too perfect. 
Um, it re it, the only thing we're losing, and I mentioned this to Tim earlier, is resolution. Like, I mean, my work is typically very, very large, and I can't do that with this stuff. So, um, but yeah, I think that there's a bunch of questions about using what tools we use. And, and I think the cool thing about stable diffusion, which I'm not using, is that you can train it on your own work. Um, and Ivy and I've had just recently had a conversation about that, the idea that I can take an input, you know, the last 20 years of photography that I've made and let the, let the um, stable diffusion be trained off of that is amazing. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing now, you can, you can really inform your work by inputting your own images into mid journey as well. So, and, and I think to Chris, to your point about everything kind of looking the same and kind of jaundiced, I think that really is about how you're how you're dictating the language that you put that you input um you know the one thing i do notice is that if you're nondescript about the figure it almost always comes back as a female ages 20 to 26 and you know in really good shape and i think that's just because it's being trained on photography and you know the vast wealth of photography you know with fashion and everything else has been females in that age group so I find myself combating that a little bit. I, I know we're, there. I know we're just out of time. So it sounds like a perfect moment for me to lob a, a bomb and then walk away because we're out of time. But I wanted to piggyback off of what Walter and um, Christopher was saying, and just like to emphasize that like AI is not neutral. Um, the images that it it outputs is as perfect and actually as imperfect as the human data set that's putting into it. And there's all sorts of conversations about as like what Walter just noted, the very specific biases in the images that it outputs. Um, but then also on another side of like that AI is not neutral. There um, is you know a fair amount of, of literature out there that like it takes math, that this is not just imaginary in the cloud, it takes massive servers. So to um, input and then to also generate these outputs. So when I want to use uh, chat GPT to write my, fill in the blank, a quick, you know, intro for me, like the, the, uh, one person commented, every time you type into chat, chat GPT, a coal, um, coal plant fires up, right, that, that it's not, you know, there's all sorts of actually sustainability implications behind using this as a massive tool that I think we also have to think about as um, where our footprints are. I, I mentioned that just in part because thinking about um, Christopher's recent project about the climate change as a, part, as a part of your artistic practice and thinking about how, like the data set behind that that's generating it is a part of that bigger um, and highly problematic conversation as well. I, you know, I, I would push back a little bit on that because I think that if we go down that road, then we really need to um, start to analyze where all of our materials are coming for. So like, I mean, I was a printmaker as well. So if you look at, you know, whether you're doing stones or copper or tin and if you're doing photo emulsion and what is the chemical the you know what are you doing with the waste from the you know silver gelatin prints or whatever like i mean all of these if you're a creative and you're not thinking about where your materials are coming from like that's a whole nother conversation that you need to have because it, like if you look at some of the the pigments that are used in in oil paints and whatnot like they're substantially more toxic for the environment than one more piece of coal in the in the atmosphere so like I don't, I, I'm not saying it's not important to think about it, but I would just say like, it's not a whole lot different than a lot of the other things that we're already doing. If you're using spray paint, you know, like what that's doing to the atmosphere is probably substantially worse than creating 500 images of, of something in mid journey. And I use spray paint. So I'm, I'm guilty of that. I'm not judging anybody else. I'm just saying like, if we're going to be self-aware, like it's not just this, that's problematic. All art, generation is problematic. I wish that we had another hour, but I think we'll probably lose everybody. And um, uh, I really appreciate the time that you guys have taken to answer these questions and think through these, the time that you've spent thinking through it on the on your own and also the time that you've shared with us thinking through some of these topics. There's a whole stack of questions that we didn't get to in the chat. And uh, I am sorry that we're not getting to all of them, but I really appreciate everyone's time uh, in this conversation. We're going to send out an email with some of the links that we've mentioned here. And um, I, I would love to know if there's other panel topics that you you here or in the audience would like to address in the future. Um, any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Again, I feel like I'm 
cutting off that conversation right in mid mid stride but I, I think uh, for me, I'd say, like, you know, graphic design has often been a little bit flat footed when it comes to embracing technological change, like the internet, computers, generally computer, uh, the internet, uh, smartphones, like app design. We often think these are kind of below us in some manner uh, and ignore them uh, and catch up 20 years late. Uh, so uh, I think we're, uh, we should really try to avoid it this time uh, if we can. Because it's going to ha the, this isn't going back. This isn't going away. Anybody who doesn't want it to be here, uh, I appreciate that sentiment, but it's um, it's not going anywhere. So I, I think we need to um, try to uh, actively participate. Um, I would encourage for all three of the panelists if there are specific. Um, I, I read an article a couple of days ago about uh, a prompt that instead of in, when asking for people of color, it didn't show any people of color until you added the word poor. And so it was like getting to what Lindsay was talking about, the questions of bias and some of these data, data garbage in, garbage out, some of the, the problems with the data set training. So if you have resources that you think would be helpful in following up to this conversation, like that article, I'd love to share that out as part of the, the follow-up to this conversation. Again, and those are those that those that are interested, there's also, um, if you're interested in following a group online, there's a Facebook group that I'm involved in that just explores some of this stuff. Um, so if you're interested, reach out via Facebook, and I'll be happy to tie you guys into that. Great. Again, I really appreciate everyone's time and the attention and the perspective that you shared here. Thank you all very much to the participants and to the audience.